Welcome, everybody. So this is my first author interview. I have Ian M. Rogers here. He is an excellent author. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm just going to say I know, I've known you for quite a while now, um, which is excellent because much better than me. Um, his new novel has come out now. His debut novel came out back in April. It is MFA thesis novel by Vine Leafs Press. Um, so one of the reasons why I brought him on here, the, really probably the crux of it is very little is on the internet right now about the discussion of indie presses. If you go on YouTube, you can find plenty of information on things like traditional publishing, how that works with getting an agent in that process. There's plenty of things on self-publishing as well. Indie publishing is a bit of a, a kind of middle ground that you don't really see talked about a lot. So I wanted to get him on here to kind of discuss that, why he chose that, what the avenues are for authors, benefits in perhaps cons of going with that process. Um, so Ian, I, I guess the main question would be, why did you go with an indie press? First off, thank you for that excellent introduction. You definitely flatter me um, with all this, but um, but yeah, it's a really good question. So a little bit about my background. So, you know, I went to grad school. I got a master's in creative writing. I was working on a first novel. I tried to get published for a while. And then I started MFA thesis novel, worked on that for a while, tried to get that published. Uh, in the grad school sort of academic writing world, small presses are a little bit bigger basically because a lot of people are chasing after kind of that name recognition, uh, recognition, that credibility that comes with having a press. Uh, in the academic world, there's much more of a stigma against self-publishing, kind of that old school, you know, self-publishing is yeah. bad, which you don't see as much in genre fiction anymore. You know, readers just want a good sci-fi story, good romance, you know, good horror, you know, and so on. Um, but in the academic, you know, sort of literary fiction world, a lot of those stigmas are unfortunately still there. Um, so within those circles, a lot of people will go for small presses again, because they want that kind of, um, that sort of CV line or that extra bit of credibility. Okay. And again, this was my background, something I was a little bit more, um, a little, a little more familiar with in that sense. Um, so I worked on an MFA thesis for, novel for a while and like a lot of writers, writers submitted to agents first, you know, you go through the query process, go through the cover letter, tried for a while, probably nine months to a year. Um, to, you know, get picked up by an agent. And I was not getting a lot of hits. You know, I had exactly zero manuscript requests um, on this book. Um, in comparison on my first book, I had about four with the same number of queries. Um, so I was getting fewer manuscript requests at this point. And uh, along the line, I'd gotten some personal feedback from agents, you know, who I'd had a little bit more contact with. Um, one, an agent that I had met uh, through grad school, and another was an agent who had actually looked at my first book several years before. And both of those agents said the same thing, which was basically, you know, your novel is too niche. You know, there's not a big enough market for it. And I think part of this is the book itself. You know, it's a book about writers. It's a book about grad school. Uh, but part of it was also the way that I pitched it. I think if I could go back in time, I'd pitch it a little bit differently. But, um, but both these writers said the same thing. You know, it's more niche. And so that made me think about small presses a little bit more because a lot of small presses, they do want to publish something that's a little bit more niche that's going to maybe get overlooked by the bigger presses, so to speak. I think that's a good point that you brought up with that. So if you're going to go into especially looking at indie presses, the two main things that you kind of highlighted was obviously the prestige is number one. I, I, I think you didn't mention name recognition, but I think the same thing of just saying prestige, which I, 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 said the same thing as well basically you know and we both kind of went through MFA programs and that's kind of drilled into to a degree like I, I was always told like self-publishing that could be where the money is but church publishing is where the jobs are right like if you want that if you want to work in academia if you want to do something yeah you need to go get traditionally published basically and yes. but the other thing obviously is the niche part right where if you're worried it's going to be traditionally published but publisher doesn't, doesn't see it as a wide enough audience to attract, well, we're not going to invest this money because it's going to be a loss for us. In that case, the indie publishing realm works well then. So to, so, so for those that want the prestige, but also have a, the book that's a bit more um, for a much smaller audience, a much smaller demographic, going with that. Um, that's a good way of putting it. I think a lot of small presses now, they're sort of filling gaps that traditional presses are overlooking. You know, Because again, the audience is too small 
or the market isn't big enough, or maybe it's a risk to take a um, to take a gamble on a new writer who's writing a kind of story that's maybe not as formulaic as yeah. other kinds of stories. Maybe the writing is, is experimental in some form. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's something about the story that doesn't quite add up. You know, it's not um, a lot of traditional publishing. Um, it's based on what are called comps, you know, the idea that you have to compare your book to existing books that have come before. Mm -hmm. And so the way that works is that, you know, you get your list of, oh, my book is similar to X book, Y book, and Z book. And the agents, editors, who um, the acquisitions people, they'll, of course, look up the sales numbers for X book, Y book, and Z book and see, mm -hmm. oh, OK, you know, these books are pretty good. Maybe we could manage that if sales are too low or I don't know about that, you know. Um, and so, and they also, they'll look to those other books and look at how are those other books marketed? You know, who are they, who are they appealing to? Can we basically kind of copy their advertising strategy with this new book? Because again, a lot of publishing is kind of based on the success of what comes before, you know, um, an example I give is, you know, remember when the Twilight books got big, you know, and all of a sudden after Twilight, there was a lot of paranormal romances that kind of, kind of got in there. It's because, you know, people were kind of publishers were looking for the next Twilight, so to speak. Gotcha. No, you're exactly correct. And that's, that's often the, I think you're exactly right. Like the, the main thing of indie press as well, potentially springboarding. You're talking about the numbers, you were talking, you're discussing the idea of people looking at like, you know, different algorithms doing well with like an indie press. That way you could potentially springboard into maybe landing that, 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 you know, agent when you have perhaps a book that's a bit more, um, bit more broad that, that, that's designed basically for a much wider um, sort of audience on the second go around if your success does well or moderate success with a big much smaller press and much smaller book at first kind of a way to test the waters I, I, I it's a good way to look at that too I, I always think back to like again I, I make these connections all the time but when I was a kid I used to love Howard Stern and he always talked mm -hmm. about the fact that his biggest thing he ever did in his career was he got a radio job in small markets first, like small guy yeah. radio markets, because yeah. you can only go up. You can like I I, I yeah. can bring in maybe like a ten percent increase in your audience. Maybe I look great, even though it's not a whole mm. lot. It's ten percent increase, yeah. and then I can just move up. It's kind of the same thing with indie press, where yeah, your first book goes through that, do well, learn to promote it, learn to market it, and then your next one that maybe has a bit a bit of a wider audience, reach out to the agents there. They'll see a track record of success on the first one, and then boom, you you have a, a much more yeah. leveraged skill going into the second one. Yeah, I, I think I think that's a really good example with Howard Stern, the small radio markets. I think that a lot of times agents, editors, when they see an unknown writer with either zero publishing credits or you know a handful of short story publication credits, publishing their novel is going to be a risk for them. Maybe the writer has a really small platform. You know, it's the only have so many followers, you know, they don't have a name out there. And so the, the risk for the publisher goes up, you know. Mm -hmm. Being on an indie press, I have found, has been a great way to build my platform as somebody who went from having zero books to having one book, which is a really, yeah. really big jump. Now I have a book that I can show people. The book is by a reputable press. You know, people can see it on Amazon. I can put it on my website. You know, it goes on my Twitter and so on. And so it's a way to to build that platform. And the indie press was my way of getting that book, getting that credibility, getting that chance. Bingo. And that it's that type of idea of, of using this basically as a way to kind of grow yourself is huge. Like there's, I, I exactly no, that, that's a good way of saying it. Cause I think there are people that are watching that might watch this video that might be like thinking maybe, I don't, you know, I don't know if I can't get like an agent, get the big five, I yeah. won't do it at all. I'll sell, I mean, I'll sell public yeah. basically at that point, or I won't do it at all because it, it's like all or nothing. People get it. I, yeah. I, I, I use the terminology. It's, I, I don't know if it's offensive, but I use, I, I use the virginity analogy of like, I'm going to lose my virginity. <laughs> you, sound like a, you sound like a guy. Seriously, you sound like a guy who's like, I'm going to lose my virginity yeah. to this amazing supermodel. Like I'm going to hold yeah. out until I meet the supermodel. I'm going to have sex with her for the first time. Like, <laughs> or, or, you know, we're reverse it, woman, guy, whatever. Right. As opposed to like having the growth mindset of, hey, it doesn't matter where yeah. the first one comes out. This book found a home. I have the skills to produce another book. Yeah. This next one's going to be better. And, and over the course of 10, 15, 20 years, you're going to see a growth in audience. You're going to see a growth in publishers. You're going to see a growth in yeah. my skills of writer and, and more and more entertaining books. 
And that's where the, you know, the money leveraging the, the film rights to get big enough, whatever, come in at that point. It's, it, the first one does not need to be the, the yes. D1, you know? The, um, um, <clears throat> the, the virginity example is, of course, demeaning towards women, but then in the writing sense, it's demeaning towards yourself. The idea that you, yes. you put it on this, this pedestal. I think a lot of writers have this dream that, you know, once I sign this book contract or get the agent or whatever, all your dreams are magically going to come true. Bingo. And I think sort of getting that publication deal, that's just the beginning. You know, it's like the, it's like a, a new step on the journey, Absolutely. so to speak. And I think it's, again, it really is a mistake to see traditional publishing, big press, agent publishing as the be all end all. Bingo. And I also think it's a mistake to see that kind of, oh, traditionally published or self-published. I either, you know, have them do everything for me or do everything myself. I think exactly. in the real world, there's a lot more stuff that exists sort of in the area between that, you know? Right. That's the, and that's the other thing too, is just learning how to do it. Like you learn how to write. With this, you're also learning how to market. You're learning how to promote. Like people yes. that, that write their books first, like they don't know how to do that. They yep. don't know how to do like hell. I don't even like I'm even with this. Like I'm trying to figure out how to use social media. With the, you know what I mean? Well, no, I think I think you you do a very good job, and I think oh, this thanks. YouTube channel itself is the type of social media outreach platform building that a lot of small and large presses want to see. You know, they, right. they want to see more stuff like that. I think it's easier to do stuff like this if you have a book, if you have a network, if you have connections. And I think these kinds of these kinds of smaller steps, these kinds of, you know, the equivalent of the Howard Stern rural small small market radio outlets are ways to make that happen little by little. I think marketing's hard. It's very it's very hard. You have to figure out how to do it. You have to figure out the marketing that works for you mm -hmm. and the best way to do it i mean you could of course you know you read the books you know you listen to the podcast you fit you figure it out but then really just getting it in yourself and promoting yourself with what you have now even if it's very little even if it's like oh i got this piece published in you know this journal or you know i made this zine myself or i self-published something on issue you know yeah there's a lot there's a lot that you can do exactly and it, it's <laughs> It's such a weird field, basically, with writing because it's it's like the only only one where the idea of working up is not like encouraged at all. Like, mm -hmm. or, or people go basically about the mentality of working up. Like any other industry, like if you're a band, you always yeah. are going to start out playing. With. with writing, it's always weird. Like it's, it's always it's, it's it's always like you want to play in the majors right off the bat. And I yeah. I, I, I said this before myself. I'm I'm as much of a victim as this as anyone that perhaps we're addressing on this video. I mean, I've talked about how my first short story that I, no one's ever going to see because I if I couldn't get into the big big you know freaking a good paris review at the you know the atlantic whatever i i was not going to ever get it out like it's, it's either there or nothing you know um but we talked about marketing as well so i, I do want to start jumping into that too because i do think you do marketing really really well in comparison to other authors that i've seen um so we'll get into that that's, next. that's a really good question so i think for me over many years of figuring out social media it's this idea of what works for me and what works for me doesn't necessarily work for others and i think about okay what types of social media do i enjoy doing and what types do i find engaging and then what do other people find engaging and kind of trying to find this sweet spot into something that suits me and suits others and can still you know attract uh, attract attention so you mentioned the blog i have a blog but i also have a day job and the, the shtick behind that is this idea, okay, how do creative people both do their craft and make money? Because often those are two things that are very separated. You know, the idea, I go to my day job during the day, I come back in the evening, and then I work on my writing, my art, my music, my acting, you know, and right. so on. And having, having to balance this. And this was something that had kind of fascinated me um, around the time I was leaving grad school, where, you know, there was one academic path that we were very much being groomed for the idea that you, you know, get a professor job, you teach, you know, you write, um, and then you make your money that way uh, through the professor's salary. And I was interested in, you know, seeing how other kinds of pr creative professionals did it, not just writers, but, you know, musicians who, you know, maybe had to wait tables or something like that. And, um, and chronicling my own struggles with this and my own sort of mental battles with this and how I was making it work um, was something that one, it was illuminating for me. And I learned a lot about my own process, but then two other people found it interesting as well, you know, seeing both what I was doing and then, you know, how I was handling um, these kinds of bigger issues. You know, I started doing interviews where I would talk to different kinds of people. I would do things like, you know, like uh, review books that are, uh, 
that were uh, relevant to the creative life, you know, um, different resources that I had found in kind of spreading this. Um, and so it, over time, it became this sort of amalgamation of all these different day job related um, related things that I found interesting and other people found them interesting too. So, you know, you get people who would, you know, follow the blog every week and so on. Um, and then also, you know, searching uh, Google type hits, you know, people just find stuff, you know, it's mm -hmm. like some of the entries are more popular than others um, in this respect, you know, um, and so people find it that way. And it's not a chore for me to blog. You know, I enjoy blogging. It's very easy for me to do. Um, it's something that doesn't take up a lot of time, but also occupies my mental energy in an interesting way, especially if I'm yeah. just thinking about a topic um, that isn't necessarily, you know, a story or a book or something, but it's maybe something that I want to reflect on a little bit further to try to understand. Yeah. That's and, how I do that. It, and I like what you said about the blog being nothing to do with writing per se, right? Because I think people that, that when they start thinking about social media, they start thinking, and I was the same way, of, uh, okay, how do I, like, how do I tweet about writing? How do I yeah. do a channel about writing, basically, right? And what you've done is day jobs. You've taken something that has nothing to do specifically with writing. It's a completely separate idea. It could be a separate hobby, perhaps. Something that is of interest, general interest, but has nothing, but is so broad in application for a topic that, doesn't have to be writing per se that way you're not just going to you know kind of narrow the niche but also it, it, it gives you freedom right talking about writing all day is not always the most exciting thing and i'm i'm saying it's the guy who has a youtube <laughs> channel basically dedicated to just writing every day i i i'm sort of i, I think the exception to that rule because i do think that people that have blogs or channels that are different from that in some sense tend to get more people, right? Like, like, like yeah. my channel gets people that are writers. You can get people, exactly you said, like that are artists, that, that are people that are, that are trying to do this hustle culture where they're trying to build their own business and, and have a day job at the same time. People that, people that just work day jobs nine to five and have a soul-sucking experience and they want to just vet and see, you know what I mean, how to yeah. do <laughs> that. Um, yeah. Yeah, you, um, again, you make a really, really good point in that um, writing, blogging about writing no one wants to read that really, you know, if, if done, if done poorly, no one wants to read it. I think, you know, if people think, you know, I'm a fiction writer and I'm working on a story about, you know, a magical story about a girl who finds an enchanted kingdom and, you know, she has these, um, she has animal friends and so on mm -hmm. or, or whatever. And so how do you turn that into a blog? You know, it's like, it, it's in the fictional realm, there's magic, you know, maybe it's young adults, you know, how do you, how do you do that? The subject matter often does not lends itself to Thank blogging you. and reflection. I think if you're going to blog about writing issues, it's perfectly po possible to do that, you know, um, yeah. either, you know, style choices, you know, you write about, you know, tone or about um, the writing process, you know, drafting, I think a lot of writers will talk about that. Um, uh, a lot of writers will, uh, will focus on word counts, which I think is often a little bit, um, maybe yeah. focusing on the wrong thing and like, oh, I wrote 800 words today. I wrote 3000 words today or, or whatever. Yeah. Um, and some, well, no, you're, you're, okay, okay, not, not to, yeah, to put no, fun. I, 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 yeah, I was gonna say, I, I, I continually rant on my thing about not focusing on word count. Like, I, I, like, so many of my videos go into just my philosophy, which is don't care about word count because the guy who writes 2,000 words in a day, maybe 250 of those words are decent words that are gonna stay. You're gonna throw the rest out. Like, if you would have done, yeah. you know, 500 words in a day, and made those really carefully considered words. Like, so two, two dull space pages that were carefully considered that you wrote down, you know, even first draft, like you put some cost effort into, and you took those same three hours that you looked for it, 2000 words into 500 words, your story at the end, it might take longer to finish. It will be of a better quality. Yes. Like, so I, I, I rang it at all the time, but. Yeah, I think the word count, and again, you don't do this, but some of the writers I see where, you know, word count, it can be construed as kind of a bragging or a chest puffing, you know, it's, it's about getting yeah. that high number it in is. some way. And it's um because that emphasis is just on the number and not on the quality of the words, you know, I think it's, it's really not worth anything. You know, you do like, um, I, you know, I read somewhere that John Banville would take hours and hours to write a single sentence and it'd be a yeah. damn, you know, damn good sentence. Cause John Banville is a very good writer. Yeah. Um, but you know, if he were to have his word count for the day, you know, it's going to be 38 or whatever, you know, <laughs> kind of cartoonishly small number, he's not going to have to go back and revise. And so if you're going to quantify your 
writing abilities or you know how how much progress you made that day i think word count is a very poor way to do it i i think about days where you know i'll write either very little or none at all but in my mind i'll solve a very specific problem that i've maybe been grappling with and i've got it you know it's like that solving that problem and knowing how to proceed is more valuable than a 5000 word day you know it really really is clarity over over just making a long it, it, it's like exactly right it, 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 it's like driving in the fog right like if you have clarity or like yes. you drive you know five miles straight or you're caught in the fog whatever and you have to you know take a detour here and go all the way around yeah you you spent more miles but you get to the same place at the very end anyways hopefully but the clarity basically got you there on a shorter distance in the long term you know um, but to go back to your, your original yeah. question about marketing i think you know like Blogging works for me. It might not work for everybody. You know, it's um, a lot of the advice I see is, um, you know, blogging works very well for nonfiction people, nonfiction writers, because you can write about your topic, so to speak. You know, you're mm-hmm. writing a book about, you know, hiking, so you can blog about hiking. You're make, writing a book about furniture repair, so you blog about furniture repair and so on. Um, I think most writers are going to have more success with, you know, Twitter, Instagram, you know, even TikTok, YouTube, you know, um, Facebook. I, a lot of writers use Facebook still. Um, the idea that you can pick a platform that you like and that feels comfortable to you and maybe find things that are interesting to post, to share, to reflect on, you know, um, the posts that have value in themselves and that people find interesting for some reason and aren't just advertisements for your book or kind of, you know, the yeah. same old, the same old stuff, you know, because people are smart. They can tell when something's being recycled or if it's just an advertisement for them, you know? No, absolutely. And, and that's, that, that's the one thing, I guess, like the general consumer thing, exactly right, is, People today, especially the youth, like people, I mean, I don't know why. Don't say the youth, it makes you sound old. Well, I, I, all right, well, I, I'm in my 30s, but people, people of the, obviously my 30s, people that are in their 20s, teens, they are more savvy than any of the generation, like, because they, they their whole lives have gotten these targeted ads. I mean, you figure someone that's like 20 years old has had high speed internet basically their entire life. They've seen targeted ads their entire life. So they can tell like when someone's trying to sell them something, they're more savvy than any of the generation. So your content cannot be buy my book or the reviews are great buy my yeah. book or sponsored ad buy my book. You have to, especially if you're writing, you have to kind of, it goes to like the, Gary Vaynerchuk had once said, it's it, it, like boxing where, where you like jab, jab, jab them to the right hook. Like the right hook is the mm. sales pitch, right? Like buy my book. You can't go into a boxing fight and do the right hook right away. Yeah. You have to jab, 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 like put up interesting content people like, people fall in love with you. People get mostly invested in you, you know, in, in a sense. And then make the pitch after like a year or two of doing this when your book's done. Make that pitch because you got a year or two of goodwill and good karma built up to people. Um, I think now, um, your, your point about going. younger people is a good one because yeah. I think a lot of writers who are looking to use social media can look to what younger people are doing on social media, whether they're writers, whether they're creative people, or whether they're just sharing stuff for their friends. What are younger people doing that's maybe a little bit fresher than things than, you know, us in our 30s or 40s or, you know, 40s, 50s, 60s are doing? You know, how are young people using social media today is, I think, is a really important thing to look at. It is. I think it's also very intimidating, though, too. Like it can be. It can we, be. We, I mean, I, I know me and you have both been to like writers' meetings, basically, where, where we get just general writers to discuss their writing, and we've talked about social media with them. They're all older than us, right? So when I say that, I mean they're probably like, you know at least probably most of them are in their fifties. Social media to them is very very scary. Like the, the idea of going because they don't know basically what what younger generation what, what youth basically people that are using me they don't know what, what they're into what what to say how to act they don't it doesn't quite quite so it can be very very intimidating for someone at, at the start and i think the big thing for people that are trying to become writers that are or writers that are trying to promote their work is find a way to kind of tiptoe and like ease your way into it yes. kind of wade out into the water a bit um and so you mentioned obviously instagram you mentioned twitter um having probably a better roi just for your time in terms of getting like converting to a book sale how should someone start, do you think? Like, and, and this is actually good for me as well, because I have, like, my Instagram is like nothing. So, so like, how, no, would, how would someone start, in a sense? So, first of all, I think just to start, the first step is signing up. You know, that's, yeah, the, that's the first yeah, step. I think yeah. that's a bit, that's a hurdle for a lot of people. It can seem like okay. this big, scary thing. 
Um, you know, just one, just sign up. And then two, find other things to look at. Find other things, you know, whether it's writing, whether it's authors, whether it's just things that you like on the um, on the medium. You know, it's like, you know, on I'll follow a lot of movie people. I'll follow old adventure game stuff. You know, I'll follow random famous people that I that I like, you know, or that I have clever things to say or to show or to post, you know. And so I'll do that and try and follow a variety of things to get an idea of what different people are doing on social media. I think it's really easy to get caught into a tunnel of, okay, I'm working in this field. And so I'm only going to follow and look at what people in this field are doing. I think that's a mistake. I think, I think you should be looking at at a broader, broader context. And so familiarizing yourself with, you know, your social media outlet of choice, um, I think is a really good step. And, um, and, and three, not trying to do it all. Not not okay. trying to do it all, you know, saying you know, I need a Facebook and an Instagram and a Twitter and I'll get on TikTok too, you know, and so if that's too much, you know, choose one, start with Instagram. I think Instagram is very, very easy yeah. um, to start with for a lot of people. Go from there. If you don't like Instagram, if it's not, you know, pictures aren't your thing, if you're not finding material to post try Twitter, go from there. You know, it's like some people don't like Twitter either. Maybe TikTok is for you, you know, or maybe you want to, you know, stick with what, you know, go with Facebook. You know, I think there's, there's something to be said about finding something that fits, fits your groove. And then after that, I would say just experiment, you know, it's like, think about, think about the things that you want to see on social media and try and make some version of that, you know, because My rule of thumb is if something something's interesting to me, odds are it's going to be interesting to other people also. You know, so exactly. I'll try and replicate that. I like you said that too, because the biggest thing I like, especially for me when I was starting my social media, even when I started my Instagram, um, was why like nothing I do is interesting, right? But like you type in a computer all day, I like what photos can I possibly take that are interesting? You you have but, guitars behind you. I think you do interesting I, stuff. I think you yeah, do interesting stuff. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, I know the strat back there. <laughs> the less ball um but yeah absolutely so but just taking things that are not within your niche like like things that are not just writing related take photos of other things and anything that might be of any small interest you're absolutely right but like that that's going to get you the most basically like, like, like the most kind of conversion or the most interactions um like even like you mentioned that i'm thinking back to mine now i i think the one i got, got the most likes i think on my my page now was and there, there was a highlighter that that, that that said that said uh, it was like a high mark um like the highlighter basically and it wrote oh hi like it wrote, oh, oh hi mark says, oh hi mark that's funny like in my head i was like oh this it's is very funny, funny thing. you know people love very the niche, room or, you know? yeah, exactly right but very niche right not many people have seen the room people get the reference set so i think that just putting that on the on the like taking a quick photo so right there, basically, that got more than anything else. Just this weird idea that you wouldn't think is that funny happened to work. Um, but exactly right. So not being not being afraid to put just things that you might think that only you're interested in, like yep. the flowers outside your house, take a photo, the, the bird in that tree over there. That's interesting. You, you know, what the, if you're going for a walk and you see the you know river or, or, or if the, 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 the cafe looks kind of interesting, then take a quick photo of the, of the ambiance. I- but I think a good rule of thumb is if you're interested in something, then you have yeah. specialized knowledge about that thing. If I'm interested yeah. in birds and bird watching, I'm going to know more about birds than most other people that I interact with. Right. So if yeah, I look sure. in the trees and see birds, I'm going to know which birds are maybe special or interesting or unique. I'll be able to take better pictures. I'll be able to talk about those birds a little bit better. And yeah. I can just craft a more interesting post just based on my knowledge basically versus maybe things that are more random or that I think other people want to see. Again, it's, I think it's very important to trust what you are naturally interested in. So I, I used to, I used to live in Japan. I was there for a long time. And so in Japan, I would take pictures of just random stuff I saw on the street, you know, signs, cool buildings, things that were maybe different, um, you know, than you would find in America, you know, um, people drying their clothes outside, or for example, you know, this vending machine looks very different, or like a newspaper vending machine, you don't see those in America anymore, you know, and so the idea that you, um, you know, you could see something, observe it, you know, um, I could tell people what it was, um, share my knowledge of Japanese culture, and just have that as something to post and share with people. Mm-hmm. It's not necessarily the most relevant. MFA thesis novel is not about Japan, you know, um, yeah. but there is there is that factor. Okay, people can know me 
and they can see something interesting based on what I'm posting because of this, uh, because I'm able to, you know, generate something of value through social media. Exactly. And, and, that, and that, the, that ending thing that you just made is correct in that you're, you don't need to make a link between both. You, if you like bird yep. watching, you don't have to have, write a book about bird watching and tie that in. Your book can be, can be about a small town wrestling novel, right? It, it just happens to be, these are two different aspects of your personality. People want to see yes. you, you are the product, like your personality is yes. what, what people want to see. They don't, it's, it's, and, and this, this is part of something that, that, that really is paradoxical to me and, and wigs me out because it, no other product mm. for the most part is like this, basically, but no one cares about your book, right? In the sense of when I go into social media, I care about you, yeah. you the person first. Like your book's separate. I, I, yeah. if I like you as a person, I'm going to maybe buy your book and hopefully I'll be entertained and enjoy it. But I am not following you initially because of, of your book and what you're writing about. Yes. Because I am falling in love or, or I, I am, I find the person that you are to be an interesting person that I want to follow, right? I want to follow, you know, yes. I want to see more of your posts. And being very earnest and very honest and showing more than just the writer side is probably what's going to get people initially. Because if you are someone that likes bird watching, hey, great, now come in there, right? I, I, I've spoken about my, my, my chess hobby, right? If, if, if I play some chess tournament, right? I take some photos of, of the game or video basically playing, right? That becomes more and more interesting, even though it has nothing to do with my writing at all. It just shows me it's more of a human being. It's like everybody else, like a date, you know, just I'm, I'm a somebody like anybody else. Yes. And then hopefully that turns into maybe some sort of conversion down the line. I, I think the way a lot of internet content works, and I hate that stupid word content, you know, know, it's such it's, a catch all for different it's, types of yeah. types of art. But the way a lot of stuff on the internet works is that the vast majority of it is free and people, you know, they want to, you know, pull, pull up their phone and, you know, find something and find stuff right. to read, listen to, watch, play, e experience on there mm -hmm. and get this material for free. And then over time, over the, uh, over, you know, however long of doing that, they become familiar with the people and with that material themselves and they get to know it a little bit better. You know, they're, you're using this for free. And then maybe there's a point where like, oh, okay, I'm interested in this person or, you know, this YouTuber or this musician or this gamer. Oh, now they are coming out with something else that is, you know, it's paid, whether it's a book or it's a, you know, a video, a movie download, or it's, um, you know, it's an album or something else, you know, you like their material, you're used to them, you want to support them. And so it's this idea, oh, of course, I will then contribute money towards this because it feels yes. like you're already in that groove and familiar with this as opposed to who's this stranger and, you know, why does he want me to buy his book? You know, I think that using the internet as that kind of inroad is something that any creative person can do when it comes yes. to making someone familiar with you and you and what you have to say and what you have to put out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess to summarize that, like the main thing is just being authentic and being you and not just focusing on the writing, like focusing on different yes. aspects of you. Uh, and because the more the more of a, of a human being you seem, the more people are going to want to just yes. follow because they have to find that you're interesting. Um, and, and, and don't and don't get yeah. me wrong, we've kind of been talking about just you know, using different hobbies or aspects of yourselves. I think if you can tie your social media or your web presence into your book somehow, that's yeah. a good thing. That that really, really is. And I um, but world, not yes. every writer in your world, you know, it's like, you know, it's, and I, I do post thing, you know, my book's about academia. So I'll post, you know, academic type things or, you know, about the, about the Midwest or, you know, the, the sort of business of creative writing um, because that's a natural tie in. I think if you can find things like that to do with your book, Mm -hmm. um, as a writer, I think that can make a very strong connection. Not every writer will have that or be able to do that all the time, but if you can, I think that is very good and very powerful. Absolutely. Yeah. If you could do it, I completely agree. The reason why I was mentioning that though is because for, let's be real for a fiction, right? Not a lot of fiction necessarily ties into what you do. Like people that, especially genre, right? People that write fantasy, sci-fi, right? There's no, yeah. there's no alien planet. You know what I mean? But like in the real world, there's no, there's no mystical horses that are, you know, or, or wizards coming <laughs> in. Um, but, you know, I'm saying because like when I, when you, what, a lot of the advice when you first start basically was, was, was to come up with a, a platform, right? Yeah. But when they're talking about, but that's, that's for nonfiction basically. When someone says come up with a platform, right? Like, like um, your platform is, is, um, 
what, what whatever social cause you might want it to be you know mm -hmm. um, God, we did what, what we, we had a mass shooting right so so like uh, increase gun um gun awareness of right? gun yeah gun gun, gun control yeah that, that's your platform that's great if you're gonna write a book now about maybe, maybe about a mass shooting maybe about a shooting coming together after a mass shooting if you're gonna write a book about or, or just nonfiction basically one maybe doing analysis psychological analysis of this right works great but that doesn't necessarily work if your story is going to be, but if you're writing, you know, a fiction story, right? You, again, like the sci-fi, right? So, so if something has no necessarily no real world context or no context to what you do, I think a lot of people get very discouraged because they can't find a way to tie it in. So if you can tie it in, great. But if not, focusing on content that just makes you seem more of an individual, makes you just seem like more of an interesting person is what you want to go with instead. And, and you make an interesting point, too, in the idea of, you know, you mentioned this idea of um, posting about a cause or making yeah. your feelings about a cause known. I think um, a lot of writers will do that with uh, political ideals they that they yeah. believe in, you know. Um, I think that works best when it's very focused and consistent and yes. done over a period of time and not just, you know, the latest thing is to support this. So I'm going to tweet about that. I think that can be, you know, a little bit hokey sometimes. Um, you see a lot of that on Twitter, where there's a lot of, you know, political conversations of, of every kind. I think that can get oversaturated if done poorly, or if you do it in argumentative or in a negative kind of way. But I think if done well, supporting a political cause consistently and thoughtfully in a way that feels really real and genuine, I think people mm -hmm. resonate with that. I think that I think people appreciate that. I think you're right. No, and that often is, if you're going to do Twitter, I mean, to be frank, that, that often is, is one of the, the, the trending topics on Twitter are usually something something political. So, so if you have something political you want to say, some viewpoint you want to have, that you have, that you can articulate well in 140 characters, whatever it is, then yeah, do that because that that's that's quite literally like that's that's going to get you some sort of traction, basically. That's like, yeah, so not being not being afraid of touching on certain subjects that a little bit touchy can be very, very good if, if you're able to be very concise and very thought out with your answers. Part of the reason why I don't have a Twitter anymore is because I, in 140 characters, I, I don't know how to make my position concise without, without my views being misrepresented. So I could not, and also like, like every every hour of the day being on, like you have to be on there so frequently for me, I couldn't do it. But you, you, you um, yeah. yeah, I think that's, that's one way to do it. I think um, a lot of the social media is really good now with advanced postings, you know, the yes. idea that you can write out all your tweets for the week, you know, on, on one of these programs and then schedule them. Yep. Um, I know, especially with Twitter, a lot of, a lot of people will use, will use that. Um, but you bring up another point too, in that, you know, sometimes, you know, politics is very complicated and social issues are very, very complicated and it's not always conducive to, you know, a single tweet, you know, yeah. and that, um, and I think a lot of things that are boiled down to con to a single tweet can be very, um, very oversimplified. You know, sometimes there's just knocking the other side, you know, or putting something down. It's a lot e easier to be negative on Twitter, you mm -hmm. know, in that shorter format than it is to explore a bigger idea. Yeah. And so when I talk about the social media, political social media posts that aren't interesting to me, they're the ones that are repeating a very basic idea or, you know, just slandering the other side. And that I think has very limited kinds of value. It does. Yeah, absolutely right. The other thing too is, I mean, you do also in that you need to have a certain level of like wit. Basically, I think as well for all these things, like either have wit or like be really clever, mm -hmm. and like on the spot too. Like, like, like if you're the kind of person that can come to come back really quickly or come to come respond to something very quickly, this could be very helpful. If you're someone basically that, that that needs to take time to like process a response to certain things, right? Well, you know, it, it's not. Twitter, Twitter works so fast; it's not always the best yeah. for that either. Um, so so you kind of kind of find what kind of person you are, but definitely being willing to go in that direction don't shy away from that like it, and controversy in all honesty tends to work out in favor of the person but more often than not like the press you get and the procedures you get basically you know from from making things that maybe might go against the grain you're gonna probably win out because you're gonna with especially twitter every single pocket of, of politics and worldviews are on there so if the 90 percent of people disagree with you that 10 percent is going to be very fervently loyal to your to your position there and you're going to get some traction that way so you, you can't controversy can be leveraged pretty well in that sense um again no, the, starting out though i don't know how well like with no like with no like if you fall this, this is this is kind of down the line basically you get a bit of a presence on there i guess 
Um, well, you make yeah. a, you make a good point in that I think there is a lot to be done with politics on social media, and I honestly don't, you know, just because writing about politics or political issues is not interesting to me. Mm -hmm. If something, if I feel very significantly about an issue, you know, sometimes yeah. I will weigh in, but this is this is very rare. I think. I mostly have other things that I want to be reflecting on and thinking about and sharing with people. Any idea that I have, usually somebody else can say it better. So I usually let them, um, let, let them do the work. Um, and also it's, it's kind of just not where my mind goes, you know, mm -hmm. it's, um, I, I think that, you know, especially after, you know, a rough four years of the Trump presidency, you know, I personally feel very oversaturated by politics and after, um, you know, after that really wanted to step away and not engage with that as much as I was, especially on social media. Um, so I have been, you know, especially since, again, especially since the Trump presidency, my posting about politics has gone down. A lot of good has come from that because again, I've been able to focus on other things with my mm -hmm. social media. Absolutely. And, and if you're someone that, that cannot, I guess the last point I guess to make to that is like, if you're the kind of person that can't let something go but, but like, if you get a fight if you get an argument with someone on twitter right and, that, and that sticks in your head and that's rallying around your head for the rest of the day that's going to affect your right that's going to affect your yeah. life that that social media should be fun like to me social yeah. media should be it's a tool but it, like like even though it's, it's it's a tool for marketing you should be enjoying it right like like, like if i wasn't getting a joy out of doing these videos i would never be doing it right there's a certain joy in doing it, it doesn't yeah. necessarily feel like a job in, in, a, in a great sense same thing with that. Like if you're going on there and making these posts and also and like like the 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 arguments you get in there, the blowback, whatever it is, it's getting too much. Stop doing it. Switch to something yeah. else. It's not worth the 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 kind of the, the anguish and the torment and all that stuff. Basically, just to just just to be doing what you think is a good marketing practice. I I, I agree with that. It's there's a lot of toxic behavior on social media just by its very very nature. Yeah. I think we've, we're seeing more of that in recent years, and I think people are becoming a little bit more aware. The toxic behavior is still there, but I think people are becoming more, more aware of it. And I think the best thing you can do as a writer or any creative person looking to build a solid, responsible platform is to not engage with that kind of toxic behavior, yeah. is to just ignore it. Don't feed the trolls. Don't look at the comments, you know, don't weigh in, don't get sucked into these arguments, you know, mm -hmm. um, don't see your social media as being about that. You know, as right. I, I think about the, um, I think about the people I really respect on social media who don't do that. They just don't do it. You know, you yeah. don't, you don't, you don't see that from professionals. And then I look at, you know, people on social media who have a pretty big platform who are bullies or name callers or who will do that kind of slander. And it looks very immature. It really, really does. I don't like yeah. seeing that. <clears throat> Absolutely. You're exactly right. I mean, yeah, I mean, that, 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 that's the whole thing is it, it, like, you'll, if you're the kind of person that, that can pretty much see that and not like, if, if you want, if you want your work to be viewed in a way that is, it ties, ties back in the book, if you want your work to be viewed as is very mature, very thought out, like you want to be viewed as a very, you know, well thought out author, right? You can't be doing that. Like you can't be the guy yes. on there making these immature things and all of a sudden expect people when the time your book comes out to take your book seriously, right? To take, to take no matter how good your work is, it, it, there's going to be a connotation there. You have to be a sort of professional in a sense if you want your work to be viewed as professional as well when that comes around. Yes. Um, but you mentioned obviously your blog is called But I Also Had a Day Job. I want to talk to you a bit about day jobs because this has obviously my sabbatical. This has been a huge thing, I, I think, talk for me, myself, and also mm -hmm. I think for most writers in that obviously you have to work, you obviously you have, day jobs are unavoidable. And I feel like we collectively, I think most writers tend to have day jobs that maybe suck. Maybe, maybe I, I feel like they have day jobs that either interfere with their lives, they interfere with their, their creative work, or it, it, it's, they're, they're trying to survive somehow by doing one. So I want to go into a bit more about day jobs. Specifically, though, I wanted to start off by asking you, what was the most bizarre day job you ever worked? Like, the most like craziest one the most um that's pretty easy so about four years ago um i got a job as a technical writer database manager for okay. a small electronics reseller um here in new hampshire 
And it was a small startup company. It was 12 employees or whatever it was, you know, I worked in a warehouse, um, you know, writing these um, descriptions of things that the company was selling on Amazon Newegg and so on. Yeah. Um, and then a lot of database management type stuff. Okay. Um, and it was a small startup and um, it was in a lot of ways, it was a nice job. It wasn't that busy. I had okay. my own office. People weren't bothering yeah. me, so I could take it easy or often, you know, work on my writing at work, you know, steal yeah. away an hour here or there. Um, and I did this for a while and for a while it was going pretty well um, until it became known that the company was basically doing some illegal things um, on the tax scale um, and in cheating some employees out of overtime. A lot of power harassment was going on there, yeah. breaking of state and federal laws. Um, and this was a pretty rough conundrum for me because mm -hmm. I was not personally being affected by these things. You know, it's, okay. I had, I was off in my own little world, you know, yeah. our own little niche, you know, um, this was, um, you know, this was something where, you know, I had carved out a little place for myself. Um, but I didn't like the idea of living in this place or working in this place where people were being exploited. I didn't, mm -hmm. I didn't like that. Um, and I basically chose to, you know, compromise this position that I was in because it wasn't right. You know, I didn't like seeing yeah. my coworkers being treated this way. Um, I had also gotten, you know, some friends of mine jobs at the same company. They were looking for people. Um, the friends of mine were being exploited, you know, and it's, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't like seeing that, you know. Um, yeah. So it became a big thing. We brought some things to the attention of the boss. You know, some of them were fixed. Some of them weren't. There were a few confrontations. Yeah. Um and I ended up, I ended up leaving, my friends ended up leaving. Um, and uh, I, I wrote about the experience um, on the blog, but the thing that it taught me the most was yeah. that it taught me a lot about what I value, you know, and this idea yeah. that if I'm going to have a job or have, you know, work that is doing something bad for society, is causing bad things to happen, if I'm supporting a manager who is exploiting other employees that yeah. makes me complicit in that and i didn't like that that didn't make me that didn't make me comfortable so i realized that whatever job whatever day job i had however i earned my money it had to be something where i could go home with a clear moral conscience at the yeah. end of the day maybe this is an extreme example because you know most people aren't involved with companies who do illegal things i mean i mean or there are plenty of companies who do you know immoral or dishonest things or you know it's, you're working for the coal companies yeah. or you know oil plants or something like that um, or other businesses that exploit people um, but to be faced with that kind of challenge yeah. directly the way I was it made me realize okay whatever I do I have to be on the same page with it morally good man. I had that Lots. Okay. So extreme. So it's so extreme, extreme no. answer. Um, but in, in terms of bizarre jobs, um, you know, I worked as an online test grader for a while, um, which okay. was basically me at home, you know, on the clock. And uh, I had to read these um, essays for the SAT or other standardized exams that yeah. um, students had handwritten and okay. they needed a human to, you know, read them and then grade them according to this ranking scale. Yeah. And um, it was a very monotonous job. You know, the topic yeah. was the same for weeks at a time, you know, and yeah. you would see you know, so many of these essays. Um, and there was more or less a quota of 20 essays per hour okay. is what it was. So one essay every five minutes, basically, is, is what it was. Um, and so once I got good, once I figured this out, I could do an essay every one or two minutes, right? Yeah. So, you know, you, um, you do a couple of essays and then you take a break and you work on something else, you do a couple more essays, you take right. a break and work on something else. Um, so it was very good for working on things like email. Um, okay. What I used to do is when I was um, looking for uh, small presses and agents to query, I would be at this job, you know, have the test grading window open. And then the other window would be, you know, looking for agents, you know, so I was able to harness my day oh. job time okay. and still yeah. meet my expectations of the 20 essays per hour. So I like to speak. Um, and this, again, this worked well for a pretty long time. I could be pretty efficient at work mm -hmm. doing this. Um, but I just got burned out doing it. You know, you can only read the yeah. same essay so so many times. A lot of eye strain, mm -hmm. and then um, a lot of issues with multitasking. Sort of having these multiple windows open. Yeah, I would feel kind of brain fried at the end of the day. So I realized too. You know, I didn't want to have a job where I was. Didn't want to have a day job where I was just all over the place and very scatterbrained as a result mm -hmm. of doing that kind of work. 
absolutely and, and that's so you've hit upon like three or four different i guess like connecting ideas that i think define what a day job should be in that obviously you mentioned you mentioned the, the work not being too strenuous ha have your free time you're able to build your writing around it potentially being monotonous i i think and, and you feel free to offer a counterpoint but i think the idea behind a day job is that it comes secondary to your creative work right yes. like it's yes. it's like it's like the, the, the that little puzzle thing when you're like they give you basically like the, like when you're in high school whatever where they give you like the rocks and the sand little rocks and you have to put the big rocks in first mm. and then like the idea being that you have to have like your foundational things in first and then yes. sort of like fill it up same thing you're right like the right needs to be the primary thing like your writing comes yes. first and you get a day job around it uh, you know so if if you like to write in the mornings get a day get a job in the evening time instead that's maybe not too monotonous basically but but not too mentally taxing something that can something that you can go in basically with a little, little bit less energy but you can go in and kind of do your own thing in the quiet while you really think about what you're going to write the next day or, or that evening yes. maybe have a chance to read like getting a job that has a, a certain beyond the financial like the benefits are very very subliminal benefits right they're very you know sort of more free time less less mentally taxing Thing, things that aren't like are going to be on the job description, but things that you can kind of ascertain later on. And so I guess for you, is there, is there like an ideal day job in the sense of for a writer, is there like an ideal like, like category of things that should be checked off to meet that? So, yeah, I, I think that any job that allows me the freedom and mental energy to write Okay. is in that sense the perfect day job it's something that doesn't interfere and allows that sort of time and mental space and i think there's a lot of ways you can get that i think a day job that is relatively few hours per week but maybe has a higher hourly rate is uh, has tremendous potential in that in that respect right now i work as an editor so i do developmental editing i do copy editing i do zoom calls writing coaching uh, with clients, and I'm able to work relatively few hours a week doing that at a pretty high hourly rate. Okay. So it's also, you know, completely self-guided, so I can work on it, on that work in the uh, afternoons and evenings, save yeah. my mornings free for writing. So I have okay. that. I've had other jobs where, you know, they were just part-time, you know, X hours per week, and that mm -hmm. provided extra time for writing also, or jobs that were very flexible, or like I said, with the electronics job, jobs where I could steal a bit of time uh, on the clock to write. Right. And I think that can be very, very helpful as well. So there's more than one way to find this. There's, yep. um, And I think everybody should look at the opportunities that are available to them, the resources that are available to them, um, the jobs that they could maybe get or have the potential mm -hmm. to get where they would be able to get this time somehow mm -hmm. is very, very important. I, yes. And I think you were hitting at, or you were kind of talking around the idea of working as little at the day job as you can, right? Like getting the idea of a day job basically is that you do it as minimal as possible. So ideally, like we were talking about, you were mentioning, obviously low hours, high hourly rate, part-time, getting a job that's maybe not necessarily full-time, like for a writer, not, having to rely upon a full-time job would be the ideal yes uh, and I, I the reason why i'm kind of bringing this up is because there's no day job that's ever going to outdo your lifestyle so this is kind of, yes. kind of point i'm trying to segue to I, yes. i've talked before about my, my channel about this before but the number one thing that a writer needs to have is the ability to save money because it's like it's like spending money, right? So, so if I'm if I'm if I'm trying to build up my savings, right? Like, like if I make a hundred thousand dollars a year, but I blow a hundred in five thousand dollars a year, basically on cars, <laughs> you know, cars, boats, women, drugs, whatever it is, what's going to happen is at the end of the year, I'm going to be five thousand dollars poor. Even though I'm making all this money, I'm not saving yes. any. Basically, I'm losing. So I I don't actually make any. Extra. You don't you don't actually make yes. any money. Same thing with being a writer, right? Like it's it, it's like you can work all these day jobs you want. If you're not saving the income and not not able basically to build up something off of it, you're always going to be a slave basically to the system of needing to work 40 hours a week. As opposed to if possible, getting rid of your overhead, right? Like cutting back your overhead, scaling back things in your life where you don't have to work the you know 40 week, where you can work 25 hours a week instead and take 15 hours that you can be working in writing instead. Because 
writing like anything else, it, it, it's a matter of time, right? Like the, the skill of writing takes time to develop. It's not just, it's not just you sit in every single database typing away. The person that can write and focus on the writing for three hours a day versus the person that can do it for one hour a day. Yeah, the three hour a day person is, is gonna make more progress. You're gonna get more done. You're probably gonna learn more, take more away. But you can't do that if those hours are all going to be spent at the actual job where you're working. So you have to, you have to find a way to to be able to survive off less income, and get a job that pays that get a job basically that pays the same amount of income to live off of, yes. but for less hours to do it. Um, I, I I think I think the the sort of um, standard that a lot of people run into is that they have not non creative people is yeah. that they have a career that they want and they get a job in that career, and then that career pays a certain salary. And then based on that salary, they develop a lifestyle. They live in a yeah. certain kind of house, they drive a certain kind of car, yes. they maybe go out to eat a certain amount, they buy a certain amount of furniture, because they know that every week, every month, every year, they're gonna be bringing home that same salary. So they build their lifestyle around the salary. I think writers and creative people should be doing the opposite of that. Okay. Figure out how much you need to live comfortably, mm -hmm in a way that supports your writing. Okay. So, okay, you figure out, okay, I can live for $50,000 a year, $40,000 a year, $30,000 a year, 20,000. You know, it's like you figure out, figure out how much you can live on, get a job that pays that much and gives you as much time as possible. Yeah. If it pays more, great. That money goes in the bank and you use it for a potential hiatus or a rainy day fund or, you know, for nice things for yourself or, or whatever. But so in sabbatical, sabbatical, yes. Yeah. Um, or for the time when you you know either need to transition to a new job or to you know yeah take the time off. But um, but the but you basically do the reverse of what a regular salaried employee does. Is this you you build your you build your life around the pursuit of the writing outside yeah. of the day job, outside of the of the of the salary earning. And I think spending too much can cause you to take a job or work more to sort of feed those habits. You know, if you have a vice or like, like, oh, I have to get a new car every five years or something like that. Or like, oh, I have to, you know, replace this, you know, furniture with something that looks nice and will impress my friends, you know. Bingo. I think it's, um, if you, if you see the writing as important enough to make sacrifices for, above those kinds of material things, mm -hmm. I think you're going to be in a better position to really develop that craft and get where you want to go. Exactly. And I think that that last part is, is important to emphasize, which is for those that are looking to make a living as a writer, right? Like there are people, like you can, because I, 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 I know people are going to be watching this, they're going to be, you know, either e either a very happy working for it in their current job, and they just want to maybe, maybe, you know, take five years to write a book and maybe get that book published, maybe write another one. This is for this is this is more advice for those that want to live as writers that want yes. that would like to every day wake up and just really write if, if they could like yeah. take a magic wand tomorrow and you can just live you know and, and you'd be okay living on twenty five thousand thirty thousand dollars whatever it is basically a year but just writing right like just do that, that could you do that like this that's this is more for that this is not so much for. Yes those that are like, oh, I got this excellent book I like to I like to write in the evening times because it helps me unwind at night. And and maybe in five years, maybe, maybe it'll be able to be queried for an agent. Maybe it'll get published. I don't know, maybe I'll self-publish it. This is more for the, uh, I, I use the analogy all the time of, of the person that's trying to get into the MBA and the person that's trying to pick up basketball. The person that does mm. that in the evening times to write and relax, that's awesome. Pick up basketball is great. Yeah. Like, th th there should be absolutely no shame in that. Like, again, it, it's, it's, it's always weird when it comes to writing. No, you, always, you, you make a really good point. And then there's all different kinds of writers, all different kinds of creative people with yeah. all different kinds of goals. And mm -hmm. I think a person has to know their goals and be honest with themselves about those goals. Yeah. And if you don't want to make writing your career, no problem. You know, yeah. if you just want to, you know, write on the evenings and finish a book and see where it comes, see what comes of it, that's great. You know, if you just want to play with your writing and um and create things and have them be a value to you but never show anybody that's great too you know i think it's really important to be to be honest with yourself about that and especially thinking about how the other components of your life you know the income um the day job um you know the family the living situation aspects um yeah. and how where your values lie 
in in that respect. And I think that in some ways, especially over the long term, however you gain your money, however you make a living, it should be something that you can at least stomach something that's not making you miserable or causing, you know, mental stress or somewhere, something like that. And ideally it would be something that you gain some enjoyment from, you know, and I think that's something to balance as well, because if I'm working a job that stimulates me and that I enjoy, I'm just going to be happier at the end of the day or at the end of the week, which puts Mm -hmm. me in a better condition to do my writing as well. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There there, there should be no, like when we talk about day job, don't, like if there's a day job that you enjoy, go for that one. Like where yep. this, 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 this is more the worst case scenario where you need a job basically just pay the bills and quite frankly nothing, nothing. There's nothing that you enjoy doing at all that's available to you. Then approach with that mentality. But absolutely, if there's a job basically that you love that 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 that's going to be fulfilled, like go for that, man. Like yes. I, I've done both in my life, and I can tell you, like it's way better to have something that that's more fulfilling to you. And maybe you need to change and maybe you need to try on, you know, a couple of different positions, see what works for you. I think that's something that doesn't get talked about enough. The idea you can maybe test the waters a little bit in a few different directions, see what works for you with your routine, especially over the long term. I think it's really hard to tell how something's going to work out after a week or a month, but things become a lot clearer after six months or a year. They really, they really, really do when you're trying to decide, you know, something over the medium to long term. Absolutely. And, and I think for writers too, I'll be honest, like they, they tend to be the most introverted people in a lot of ways. And it, just as myself as being a bit of an introvert myself, I can tell you, like, like I'm not always, like when I go to an environment, like my initial impression usually stays, right? I'm not usually the most interactive with people right off the bat. I can't, like it takes, it does take time to do that. And the other thing too is, not everything has to be as fulfilling, right? Like if you get a day job where maybe it's not fulfilling, right? But maybe at a scale out of, out of like, out of 10, right? Like 10's amazing, one's awful. You get jobs like a six or a seven, right? That's okay. Like except for yep. the idea that your job doesn't, you, you don't necessarily need your job to bring you the fulfillment. Like your job doesn't yep. have to come from fulfillment. Your fulfillment could come from other areas of your life. Like yes. the, the you, you don't need your job to be that. Now, if you work for as we that's going to be about a third of your life. So you do want to be something good, but you don't necessarily need to drive that from there. Having your writing as your main thing gives you that level of your feeling can kind of come from, come from that sort of area as opposed to seeking it in your day job, which is probably going to bring, make, you, make you really miserable because even most of the nicest of day jobs, there's plenty of things, times, I'm sure, when like the day sucks, right? When the day runs This is true. This is true. It. So yeah. having, having writing being your thing to draw the passion from it is going to be important there. Um, so I, I think one good way to think about this is that if you want to make a career out of writing and, you know, take your writing to the next level and reach more people, I think it's really important to think over the long term. And I think it's really important to see how all these different elements, you know, social media, day jobs, marketing, you know, a plan fits in with the actual work itself. How do all of these different Um, different elements sort of combine to make what I'll call a writing life for lack of a better for lack of a better word how can you kind of join all of these things together when you're making your long-term plan and I don't think you know a person has to have the answers right away I think you can figure that out little by little sort of go and you know take baby steps in some areas and kind of feel things out see what works for you and I think as you progress the way forward will become clearer in other areas. I really yeah. do think that. Yeah. Um, and so your first novel, MFA thesis novel, which I have not found a more honest or more darkly <laughs> comedic in some ways examination of MFA life than what, than what your story is about. I mean, it's, it's, you can tell you have gone through an MFA program. Um, so I want to discuss a little bit now about what your experience was like in an, like an MFA. So, so for your MFA, I, I, I did my, my, my was a low residency program where mm-hmm. it was remote and then we met um, occasionally, but it was, it was a bit distant. Yours was a live-in program, I believe, right? Like where you were it, lived on the campus for the stipend? It, it was, yeah. So I did <clears throat> two years at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Technically, it's an MA, a Master's of Arts, instead of an MFA. A lot of those programs were sort of converted to MFA a couple couple decades ago. University of Nebraska just didn't. But again, it's the same classes, same setup, and so on. 
I had an assistantship, so my tuition was paid in return for doing research my first year and then teaching the second year. So I was able to get some job experience as well and kind of be integrated with some more aspects of campus life, academic life, make some job contacts that way. Okay. Um, there were a lot of benefits from the program, um, particularly in the career professional development side, because again, I was working with a literary magazine and I was learning the angles of that and promotion for that, marketing, um, which helped me a lot. Um, I got my first editing gigs through grad school. That was great experience, which really, really helped me jump off. And just in terms of, you know, the workshops and the craft classes, they provided one good feedback and then two, you know, just the chance to really focus and take the time um, to work on my novel and to see it as a serious thing to have these kinds of extrinsic deadlines like, oh, next Wednesday's submission day. I got to have the chapter finished by then. You know, it's yeah. I think um, especially for beginning writers, having that kind of external motivation and that deadline can be really, really helpful. That so is. Those, yeah. So those those were the good points. Um, yeah. As far as the as far as the bad points go, um, the biggest one is it was very stressful. It was very mm -hmm. very stressful. It was very busy. There was a lot of work for classes, um, for teaching, um, for sort of external things that you were doing. You know, um, pressure to be involved with activities or volunteer for this or you know read for that or help this person with this thing. Mm -hmm. So people ended up having a lot of their plates um, for a lot of the time. You know, they're very, very busy. Um, part of the reason that people were doing this is because there was a lot of worry about the future, about the job market. You know, a lot of the people that I went to grad school with, they were very, very invested in getting academic careers. You know, these yes. tenure track professor jobs, you know, which mm -hmm. were kind of the, the gold standard for a program like that, especially if you're doing PhD in creative writing, comp ret, literature, um, another aspect of the English department. Yeah. And so what what the grad students around me were doing where they were trying to get as much experience as possible, as many publications as possible, get the most prestigious journals mm -hmm. as a way of developing their career documents, building the best CV that would make them the best candidate for these jobs. And over time, I began to notice that there was more emphasis placed on that, especially at the grad student level, than there was on things like craft or making great writing or making sure your book was really, really good or doing innovative things with your writing or with your art. A lot of the um, atmosphere, a lot of the workshops that I was in, they were geared towards making writing that was very safe or very consistent or that it would appeal to this market or, oh, you should do things this way because that's the way it's supposed to be done. You know, people yeah. would kind of default to that. The idea that you could fit your writing into a niche. There was always, always this eye toward, okay, how do you make something marketable for yourself? And the unfortunate effect of this is that a lot of the writer, a lot of writers will produce work that's very um, homogenous, that looks like a lot of other writing that is, you know, very derivative of this or similar to that. And there's not a lot of room for innovation because innovation comes with risk. You know, the idea that, you know, if you write a novel that's very different, that's not going to appeal to a big enough audience or fit into these academic niches, you're not going to be a strong candidate. You're not going to get a job sorry, you know. And that to me, it wasn't why I went to grad school. Um, I went to grad school, one, to be, enough, be a better writer and to develop my novel and to learn more about publishing and, and all these different things, but to gain job credentials just for the sake of getting credentials was not one of them. And I didn't like the way that that affected the writing, the way that affected the art, the way that affected pe the way people treated each other. There was a lot of subtle competition uh, when I was in grad school. You know, the idea that um, people saw the other writers as being against them in some way. You know, if um, if I get an opportunity, I have to save this opportunity for me because other people might be competing to try and take it away from me. You know, there was this, and again, this these weren't things that were necessarily allowed, but were kind of undertones mm -hmm. that went on under the surface. And I didn't want to live in an environment like that. I didn't want to work in an environment like that. I think there's there's plenty of academic environments that are good and healthy and open and involve a free exchange of ideas, mm -hmm. but there's also plenty of toxic ones. And I wanted to stay very, very far away from the toxic ones. Absolutely. And you you I think you hit upon the two like the two aspects of the pro and the con, right? The 
at, at no point did you say the reason why you went there was for degree. That, 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 that's one thing that people that it's one of, I think very, very true of MFAs, right? Like if you want to go to, if you go to school basically for criminal justice, you're getting a degree because you need the degree to get into the field. You go and become a doctor. You need, to, you need a doctor to get in the field. You need a degree. MFAs, because it's an art, it's a, you're trying to develop craft. The degree doesn't matter, right? Like the, 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 the idea of MFA never matters. You, you can get published without an MFA. You can get published with an MFA. It doesn't matter. Like you're going there for the craft, which is very, very important. Um, but you've hit upon the other side of it, which is there's a subculture. There, there, there's this very dark sort of academic subculture that exists within that. I was fortunate enough because mine was a little residency to avoid a lot of that. Uh, I, I will say I, I know a lot of what you were talking about. I avoided at least, I think, a good amount of that just because um, you were remote, basically, and a lot, and a lot of like the the competing was just kissing the professor's asses that you that you work with for the six month period. But you don't you don't know who the other people were doing, right? So so it's you know that that sort of stayed, I guess, a bit um, kind of, kind of staved off. But there is there's a dark there's there's a dark undertone, and there is an element. I think you're right of MFA programs trying to get people to go down academic paths, right? Like it, it's, you're, you're trying to get them to go into these sort of these sort of roles, basically where you're becoming a professor, getting jobs that that are, you know, get professor, get tenure, then be set for life, like but getting into that that avenue. I think, and again, yeah. I think that's a very natural, um, natural kind of byproduct of the way these programs are set up because the people academics running them- generals like that, yeah. Well, the people, like the people running them are academics and they're, have their experience of probably going through an MFA or PhD mm -hmm. program themselves, you know, um, publishing in these high status journals, getting a tenure track job and then teaching yeah. and then becoming a mentor. And so it makes sense that this would be the kind of advice that they would be able to give. It's almost kind of all they know. They don't necessarily know about the day job world of technical right. writing or writing coaching or mm -hmm. uh, online test grading. Um, or other kinds of work. And so they're not necessarily equipped to give that kinds of advice. Some of them, I think I, I would, I will say though, if you look hard enough, you will probably uh, find some that are. Um, yeah. One of the classes I took in grad school was very, very good. Uh, it was by a writer named Richard Dooling, um, who, you know, was a very prolific writer. He worked with Stephen King a little bit, um, you know, worked on some TV shows and he had had a very non-traditional life. He had taught English abroad. He had worked a ton of different jobs. One day in class, he showed this list of jobs that he had worked and okay. he was a lawyer, you know, the, um, the, uh, the, uh, the class was sort of uh, business law and contracts for writers, so to speak. And so he was going yeah. all over these kind of legal aspects and he was one of the few um, professors in grad school who provided a different kind of role model. You know, the idea okay. that he talked about being self-employed and managing your taxes as a writer, you know, and, and right. things like yeah. that. He talked about day jobs. He talked about circuitous life paths that weren't necessarily get an MFA, get a PhD, go on the job market, get your tenure papers. You know, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't... Um, and it didn't work like that. And so being in his class and seeing him talk provided yeah. an alternate model that for me was very yeah. valuable. Yeah. And, as, and having good press is, is very, very good as well. You mentioned though earlier about the idea of like the, of like the, the kind of the hive mind when it comes to writing, right? The homogenous nature of a lot of the writing being very similar. I want to ask you, is that because as a writer in these programs, at least what I went through, we, you read some of the stuff that's the same. Like, yeah, you, you kind of get your own areas of things to read, basically. But a lot of the books that you recommend, a lot of the things that the teachers were giving to you, assign you to read, was basically the same thing, right? It was the same, the same, really the same. I can probably point out like this, like a hundred books. And I guarantee you <laughs> that like the majority of people in the program that was going through the program, basically, have read probably about 70, 70 of the books have been, were shared amongst us, right? Mm. We're, at some more side to us. So is it because we read so much of the same thing that we're, that we're kind of getting ingrained into our heads. Okay, this is good writing. Make your writing match this. Or is it you're just seeing, you're seeing the other person do this? Like, oh, this, this person here in my, in my workshop here wrote this. I like the way they did this. I'm going to try and mimic the same thing. Is it that's, that or do you think it's, it, it, it's what we're being assigned to read? Or is it being what, what, what we're just being coached to read? Like, like we're that's, being told, a, you know? that, that, that's a really good question. I think it's both of those things. I think a lot of, um, a lot of how 
academic writers learn their craft is from direct feedback, maybe suggestions, yes. oh, do it this way, or, you know, looking to others as a model, you know, maybe more experienced students, um, yep. or looking to professors work even, but then also the kind of literary fiction that does make its way around these programs, you know, the idea of, you know, the rural novel or the the academic novel or the sort of high literary novel where, you know, all the sentences are the same length and, you know, it's um, it's not a genre novel, it's about yeah. adults in the situation and so on. Um, and then to that, I'll also add that there is a certain kind of writer who will join an NMFA program who genuinely enjoys that kind of fiction. Yes. Genuinely, yeah. like, like that, those books are very stirring and very powerful to them. And to that, I will say that is great. I think we yeah. all owe it to ourselves to be honest about the kind of work that resonates. And there's some people who really, really love those books. And of course, there are plenty of, there's plenty of great literary fiction. I you know, do not doubt, do not doubt that. And, um, and so it's the kind of people who are joining, who love those books will, will naturally bring those um, those mindsets, those, um, those values to the workshop. And mm -hmm. so instead of having a sci-fi person and a romance person and an experimental person, you have maybe four people who are very invested in the literary fiction genre. Yeah. So naturally they're going to look at things a little more homogeneously. Exactly. No, you're, I think you're completely correct. Um, and I, yeah, it, cause I, I do think there's an element of development too, where, where I think, for me at least, a lot of it, I think was just reading a lot of different works where like, I can just call my own experience. Where I went there, I went there as a genre writer. I was writing a lot of horror, a lot of genre work. I went there and started reading more along with what they were assigning to us. I started seeing other people's writing. I started noticing, wow, there's a lot more depth, a lot more exploration of these different ideas mm. and themes. I want my work now to reflect that, which is kind of nice. what happened there. Um, but yeah, I mean, just the homog that, that that is probably one of the, the big different. I think is just the, the homogenous nature of the right. I, I do. I, do. Um, I I I think a lot of it comes from insecurity as well, though. I think yes. that's something that people talk about. Yes, I I often joke about like like I I I, I sounds funny. I do a TikTok about this because it's it's hilarious. Mm. But like I can tell someone when they come in like a, their freshman year what their writing is versus the sophomore. Like your freshman year, you come in there. You're all timid. You're like you're you're writing like you're, the first workshop piece you have basically this this work that you were working on for a while. And then, yeah, it was, <laughs> I'll edit it. You're scared, right? The, the the subject matter maybe is like some cliche thing. I don't know. Sophomore year, you're coming in there. You're writing. You're writing the most dirty sex, like drug, doing heroin, <laughs> do like doing lines of Adderall while banging someone from behind. Like the the work gets so much more vicious and so much more like rated mm -hmm. R. The content gets so much more absurdly like rated R. Like like. It, it, it's absolutely mm. amazing to see writers. I, I remember going from freshman to sophomore, every single sophomore person, whenever I see any kind of writing that's like, that's like mm. over the top or just like, or people that are like relying upon the content of their stuff to be like mm. really, really, like really, um, really controversial I'm trying to try to make yeah. it, make it, make it like, 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 like yeah. really risque. I can tell you that that's coming from someone that their first like year before was writing this really like timid stuff like mm -hmm. oh I don't know and now they're going over the top because in their mind they're like oh the more risky I make this the more better the work is the more the more the more honest it, it comes across to someone so that yeah. way my, my writing stronger I think so much of it is just and people imitate that right people people see it they go oh, okay so this, this is this is a risky dark stuff I'm pretty engaged by it. Does my work need to be like that to, to, to show some sense of truth, right? Do I need to go down that realm because, you know, uh, my, my characters are more honest because it, it's, a, it's, it's a, we're exploring a taboo that has not been broken before because you're taught that taboos are, are like good writing comes from, from confronting taboo. Um, well, honesty, and, uh, is, honesty is tremendously important in writing. It's tremendously important yeah. I think one in, uh, one way to um, reach that honesty is through these kind of you know, use the word risque, you know, the idea that it's yeah. the the drugs or the sex or the you know the nitty gritty. I think that's one way to find it. But if writing about those topics is to fit into a genre or to fit in with the way those topics have been written about before or in a way that's derivative, yeah. it can be just as homogenous as a lot of the cut and dry literary fiction we've been talking about you know it, it you wouldn't necessarily see it that way but i think it can fall into that trap no matter what you're writing about 
Absolutely. No, I, I completely agree. And, that, and that's, that's, that's kind of the point I was trying to make was like people go from this very timid thing to all of a sudden, like they, they, they see someone else doing this and it seems like strong writing. They're, they're imitating it basically because they think, oh, if I write this area, this makes it much more, much more dangerous, much more, much more, again, confronting the taboo. Like you're always told, confront the taboo, you mm -hmm. challenge the taboo. That's, that's what makes your writing strong. And they think by doing that, that that's what you're doing. When in fact, you're, you're, mm -hmm. you're sort of going around the, down that, that homogenous direction. And what happens is you have to kind of confront that. You get, I think, towards like the end of your program, you read your program and you re-examine it. You go, oh, okay, that was good. It got me out of my shell. It got me, you know, in a sense, mm -hmm. like, like it, it opened me up to writing things that, that not to be as timid as a writer because trepidation is like the death of any right. I will say next to writing cliches, I would say trepidation is like the biggest like thing for a writer in terms of writing, like the biggest thing. Like if you're I've, seeing calls for something, you need to write honestly about that scene. Like you can't be like, yeah. oh, my parents might read this or something like that. You know? I, I think I think that's I think that's really true. I think a lot of beginner, a lot of uh, emerging writers especially will kind of you know stick to what's safe or yeah. um, not put as much of their honesty or their own. Um, own opinions or experiences onto the page as maybe they could be doing mm -hmm. and I think a lot of that writing will come across as very stilted or like something's missing you know and sometimes that's you know that's um that's intentional and sometimes that's inadvertent because the writer just isn't comfortable enough to maybe do that comfortable yeah. enough with the craft to do that but I do think it's a common problem it is and so I guess speaking of advice then like what would you say is like the like if you give like any author like some actual craft advice like, like or just general writing advice what would you give them my advice is to uh value revision okay because in so many writing circles there's not enough value placed on revision you know the mm -hmm. idea that you can write a draft that's a skeleton of what you yeah. want to write and then you can go back and add to it later you can play with it you can delete it you can really manipulate the way the words that you wrote last week last month last year manipulate the way they appear on the page and make tremendous changes a lot yeah. of writers aren't good at revision and they'll maybe throw out an entire chapter write a new one throw out an entire book write a new book you know instead okay. of maybe instead of revising tweaking really grappling with the problems that are making that story or that chapter weak and really yeah. solving them. I think that really is just a top-notch skill when it comes to crafting a really effective book is solving problems and making those drafts better through revision. Okay. And like, all right, very good. And so that's, I, I, I tend to have like my own little keyword for that because I, I call it people deleters. I always say deleters basically mm. are people that just, throw, like keepers and deleters. Keepers are ones that go through and they don't change your chapter. They just, they go through to make, make like, like little, like little changes here and there mm. basically to some of their stuff. They don't fix the fundamental problem. It's because they think that it's grammatically correct. It looks better. Yes. They're, they're polishing the term, whatever the expression is, right? And then you have the deleters. You're exactly right. The few people that take chapters that can be redone and can be fixed and they delete and they just write a new one basically, or they yes. take a book like, you know, where you saw me do this. You saw, you saw, you saw the book before basically where I had a book that was really good, but there were some structural problems to it. And I, if I fixed two or three of those problems, right, that the book would be great. But instead of doing that, I got frustrated and I threw the whole thing out, right? The deleter, right? It's like you take the whole thing and instead of trying to diagnose the problem, you, you toss it right out. That, I, I think you're exactly right. Like the, the, the core of writing, that, 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 that is writing. The core of writing is the revision. Like, like, like the, the first draft is not writing, like in a sense. Like the writing process is not the first draft the writing process really begins after revision. Like that's, that, that's when the work begins. That, that, that's when the majority of your time is probably going to be spent is on the revisionary process. That is the job. You as the writer, that, that is your job. By deleting it, you're, you're, sort, you're sort of neglecting the actual core tenet of being a writer, which is revising what's there. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but I guess any other advice though, or like, like anything else beyond that process, like anything? I, I would say keep at it. I think endurance is very, very endurance. important. I think writing is a long game. Okay. I think that, you know, somebody who is expecting success or to finish something or to have something be good right away is setting themselves up for a letdown. Yeah. I think that, you know, somebody who really, really wants to make this a part of their life and to do something with it, should prepare to spend a lot of time with craft, a lot of time understanding marketing, 
a lot of time crafting different kinds of stories and just a lot of time organizing, figuring out how to organize their lives as a writer yeah. over the long term, over five years, 10 years, 20 years, or a lifetime. Absolutely. And you can figure this out as you go as well. Like, cause I, yep. I, I know, because you, I mean, you, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. If, <laughs> if, if someone on day one, like, it's, it's, it's a, like, like, yeah, exactly right. If, if it's someone on day one's like, hey, you got to figure out, you got to, you got to learn how to start studying the craft elements. You got to learn how to start reading books and learn how to analyze reading books. You got to learn how to organize your life around this. You got to start, you know, you know, like that, that's a lot to thrive. So, like, you can, yes. you can develop it as you go. You can start out with just writing what you enjoy yeah. like, like, <laughs> please I, I, please don't yeah. misinterpret that advice as you know you need yeah. to make the 30-year plan on your first week you know don't Absolutely. don't don't do that yeah. you know it's um I, you you figure it out as you go but you have an eye kind of towards this long game and feel bingo. out what it might look like i think it's bingo. Very exactly and speaking of long plans so obviously mfp novel is your first novel how long were you writing when when did you first get serious about your writing and then when did compared to this year like how, how many years had passed between you getting serious about i want to be a writer i'll make this my thing and then that so the uh, the novel i worked on before mfa thesis novel um which was eventually published in a very very condensed chapbook form called a kiowa bums but i had written a novel about japan and i worked on this novel seriously for about four years um before grad school and during grad school and then i tried to get it published for another two years or so you can say, you know, it was about six, six, um, six or seven years, you know, sort of working, working with this. On that novel. Now, were you, now, obviously that, that, that was not the first novel you ever worked on, though, basically, before, or, or were you writing for several years before that, too? That was, that was my first novel. That was my first, you know, time starting something and saying, I'm, I'm going to call this a novel. Of course, okay. I had done, you know, short stories. I had done blogging. I had done humor yeah. pieces. I had done, um. I had written, you know, um, I was interested in uh, uh, screenwriting, so I'd written screenplays before. A friend okay. of mine set out to make an adventure game, and we were writing design for that, you yeah. know. So I was writing, but it wasn't necessarily novels, and I wasn't sure where I wanted my writing or my writing career to go yeah. at that point. I was experimenting with a lot of different forms. I had always loved novels. I always thought that novels were sort of the pinnacle um, of what to, what me what um, what great writing could be and where a lot of potential lies, but I knew you know when I was nineteen I certainly wasn't ready to write a novel. You know when right. I was twenty three I wasn't ready to write a novel. You know um, it took you know it took a few more years before I felt ready to you know sort of start down that journey, which I think Important. is fine too. You know the idea that you can try writing in other ways. People always say, you know, short stories are kind of the training wheels or the way to get started. I think in some ways that's true, some way it isn't. I think in some ways the short story form is harder than the novel form because of how yeah. tight it has to be and how the arcs yes. have to work and so on. But if you're interested in, you know, writing comedy sketches or if you're interested in writing nonfiction or essays or poems or just you know snippets of scenes of things you know mm -hmm. and um i think that's a great way to you know hone your writing to share it with people to find outlets or maybe you know if you want to start a novel and you're not sure if you can finish it maybe it's great training great practice for you to just start that novel and go from there i think okay. a lot can come from that yeah exactly right and i think you mentioned that in 19, you were not ready to write a novel. That is a self-awareness I don't think many people have. Like, <laughs> to, be, to be, like, like I, I have never, I don't think I've heard anyone ever talk about it. I, I've heard people say, I could not have written this novel, right? Like, yeah. I, I've heard people say at yeah, 19, yeah. I could not have written like this 700 word epic that explores the life of these people in this <laughs> small community. That I've heard. I have never heard someone say, I couldn't actually have done So what, what does someone need to be able to do? What, what did you possess in 19 that, that, you, that you needed now to be able to I, do that? When I was 19, I was very aware that my writing skill was not up to, to, up, not up to snuff, not to the degree that I saw professional writers churning out. You know, it's like I okay. you know, go to the bookstore, you open the book, I see one quality of writing. I go home and I see another quality of writing. To yes. me, there was always yeah. a big division between okay. those things. And I couldn't figure out why, but I knew that little by little, just with practicing and learning more, you know, with taking more classes, with writing more, with talking to other writers, with reading more, especially, I think reading is a great, great inroad to becoming a better writer. If you're a good reader, you have the potential to be a very good writer. And so I saw this gap 
and I saw that little by little I had to move my way up so that I could write something that was polished, coherent, well-structured enough to be the same as a four serious book I would get at the bookstore. Okay. So you're talking about the prose itself, basically, what, what, what was the thing to you? The, the, you the prose itself prose... was one aspect of it. Okay. Um, and another aspect, when I was 19, I kind of doubted that I had the ability to tell a big enough story or a powerful or a meaningful enough story or a story that had enough insight that would impress other people, impress adults, or impress okay. uh, people who are older and maybe more experienced than I than I did. I looked at to a lot of my favorite novelists, you know, the the Joseph Hellers, you know, the Kingsley Amis, the the John Updikes, the um, you know, the Richard Yates's and John Steinbeck's, mm -hmm. and I saw these people as having a tremendous amount of experience, you know. Mm -hmm. And I looked at me, you know, myself, you know, I thought, you know, I'm 19. What do I know? There's so much that I haven't done yet, you know, or um, so much that I didn't understand about the world then, yeah. but still needed to learn. And so I saw myself as, okay, if I can amass more experience and understand mm -hmm. more things and do more things and see more of how people behave and characters interact, mm -hmm. then I can write better characters and tell better stories myself. Absolutely. And that's, that's probably actually some of the best advice for a young person too, is that because when you get someone that's 20 years old, part of the reason why you're writing, like especially my young self, right? Part of the reason why my writing was not really good when I was younger was... I didn't have a whole lot of life experience, right? I couldn't, like, when I came up with the idea of how do people, like, two people meet, right? In my mind, it'd be like, oh, it's a cafe because it's a cliche thing that comes to your head, right? I had not, as an adult, gone out into the world, interacted, and seen, you know, how do people talk? How do other people interact? Where are the areas of interaction, you know what I mean, allowed? And so by getting that, by getting the experience, you 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 get rid of those cliches because the-, the yes. The strength you're writing always comes from specificity. Like the more yes. you know a subject, the better you get. And I think with that, getting the experience, it just you 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 can't give it in a way. You have to physically like interact. If you want to write a story about about criminals, right, and corrections, right, perhaps mm. exploring, you know, maybe getting a job as a corrections officer and seeing that, right, because being able to actually see it firsthand and correlating that into the writing is better than anything you can come up in your head. Any kind of idea yeah. of what corrections or prisons like in your head it's not going to be as good as actually witnessing it because you want the strongest writing is the most honest and most accurate portrayal yeah. of something. It always is like the, the, the way to defeat a cliche is with specificity. The, the more specific you get with something, the less of a cliche it is. You can take the most yes. bare bones on a surface level cliched idea of a setting in a conversation. The more specific you get with it, the less it looks like that, but like you can, you can completely yeah. amass it. I, no one would even recognize it. I, I agree. Uh, it's one person can write the cliche of the corrections officer and the other person can write the real corrections officer. I, I will say that there's, you know, some potential for researching and talking to people who have experiences in that field. Not everything mm -hmm. you write has to be a lived experience. And I'll go so far as to say it's yeah. not even possible for everything you write to have a lived experience just because the nature of different characters who are going to appear in appear in books. And, yeah. But again, I think research takes time. I think talking to people takes time. And I think observing and getting to know that kind of condition takes time for a maturing adult mind to do over time. Agreed. No, completely agree. I mean, in, look, it, it, there's a saying in writing where like, if you are published, like traditionally published basically before the age of like 35, you're young. Mm. But <laughs> to be frank, like, 15 so like so what what so what like 15 yeah. years of adulthood basically to finally get published that's not that, that that's young you know it, it's, it is it's it, it, and to be frank that that's that, that that's one of the best parts of writing like right? the idea that there's mm -hmm. no way right? it's, not, it's not like football where you know 30 years old like you know yeah. you get your peak at like 30 30 something basically and it's over like you you not win the Pulitzer Prize until I think you're like you know, 50 <laughs> years old basically right like the average age or something like that like, like you don't it the longer it goes on, the better you get with this process. And it, it, that, that's really the joy of the whole thing. That's very well put. That's very yeah. well put. Writing is the opposite of sports. In that, it is. In, it is. In that and and, and, and as, someone, as, someone, as someone that enjoys sports, I can tell you it's great. But like, mm. this, is, this is better. <laughs> um, but thank you, Ian. I, I appreciate doing this interview here. Um, I, I, I do think we need to have you back again sometime. A couple of areas I think we can this, talk about. This more. was really fun. I'd love to come back. Um, it's great talking to you. I love talking about this, these types of things. 
Um, again, you know, if people want to follow me and post my social media, my novel's MFA thesis novel. If you're interested in the academic life or just like jokes, you know, check it out. It's a funny story, regardless. Like, like it, it, you'll get a laugh. You'll get like an honest. It, it's a caring story with the heart. But even if you have nothing, you if you have no knowledge at all of this, you can read the story and you can figure out, and you'll, you'll be transported to that world immediately. Um, but yes, thank you so much, Ian. Um, so we will kind of wrap this up right now. But again, next time I want to have you back because there's other areas we need to dive into on this. Take care. Uh, Thanks for having me.